66. You want to just give them a couple more minutes because people are having problems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're getting close. Oh, back down to 65, now 66. I had one person say they had to re-register in order to get back in. So there is a dual registration for this webinar because we sent the first link out in constant contact. So you registered there and then you also have to register to get into the webinar. So that's why you're being asked to register twice. Yeah, I know Dana. <laughs> So, so the alternative is just to set it up from Ring Central, and then, um, but then we can't keep track of who's who's registering and, and all. It's a work in progress. We're up to seventy. It's getting there. But what was the total expected? 113 or 112 including us okay so we're a little light we're at 79 total now so why don't we wait until it gets a little bit closer to 90 and then we can start <laughs> i got somebody who said it's the third time they're seeing me this week it's getting to be a little bit too much <laughs> one time is more than enough <laughs> That's what I was waiting for. <laughs> and according to Pfeiffer, he can hear us, so I, I don't know. We have any good Pfeiffer jokes? What? We have any good Pfeiffer jokes? <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mark and the governor walk into a bar one day. <laughs> All right, 10.06, you guys. All right, and we are at 82, so we're, can we get this started? Yeah, I think you should. Okay. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Bud Jones. I'm a partner at Misavaccia, and we've been running these um, roundtables quarterly for the last few years. And uh, this is uh, our second virtual roundtable. We ran one about two weeks ago and it went really well, had good participation. And uh, our marketing um, director, Laura, uh, and her assistant, Michaela, did a survey for topics uh, a couple of weeks prior to that. And we were uh, pleasantly surprised at the amount of people that had issues or questions or wanted to discuss personnel issues. And so, uh, as we did a, a rump meeting after the last virtual roundtable, we uh, met with John Reinhardt and talked about personnel issues, what uh, could possibly the topic, be the topics, and uh, who would be good presenters. And we came up with um, Ursula Leo. Ursula is a partner at Laddie Clark and Ryan. She focuses on employment and labor law litigation, municipal law, zoning, and land use. She has experience representing individuals, corporate clients, and municipalities and boards and land use meetings, hearings, and other aspects of municipal and land use litigation. In the area of employment and labor law, she uh, represents both employers and employees, has experience in litigating employment cases in fed, uh, state and federal courts. She also advises clients in employment contracts, compensation agreements, non-competition and non-disclosure agreements, and severance agreements. She also has experience in internal employment investigations and in preparing and reviewing employee handbooks and policies. She's currently the municipal attorney in a number of towns, as well as uh, counsel for Lafayette Township Land Use Board and Wantage Township Land Use Board. We also had um, Matt Watkins. Matt is a career professional municipal manager, serving in that position in over, uh, over the past 40 years in three different states, but primarily in New Jersey. Matt uh, currently serves as the township administrator in Bloomfield. He has served in seven different communities ranging from urban to suburban municipalities. He also served at the state of New Jersey as the director of local government services and commissioner on PERC. 
In 2019, Matt served as president for the New Jersey Municipal Managers Association. Matt is recognized for his expertise in labor relations for New Jersey professional managers and has spoken often on various labor management issues. Uh, from PERMA, we have Robin Walkoff. She's a vice president and claims manager at PERMA Risk Management Services. She assists PERMA's clients review the effectiveness of third-party claims administrators they retain. She also coordinates the process where the TPA submit claims to commissioners for settlement authority. Prior to joining PERMA, she served as senior claims specialist for complex uh, claims at ACE North American Insurance Company, now Chubb. She was also responsible for the management of complex liability claims throughout the United States, including coverage analysis, investigation, evaluation, reserve setting, and litigation oversight. Previously, she practiced law for seven years in Philadelphia. And uh, Christine Klepper from uh, Connor Strong and Bucklew. Uh, she is a managing director, senior vice president, and practice leader in their employee benefits division. Uh, she joined the firm in February of 2011 with over 20 years experience in the employee benefits field. In her role as account manager, she works with clients to set short and long-term strategies to address health benefit or health care costs, health care reform, and promoting health and productivity within their organization. She leads one of the largest client services practices in providing strategic planning, benefit evaluations, and financial analysis for their clients. Prior to uh, joining Connor Strong, she spent 15 years at Aon Consulting, where she was a senior vice president and the local market leader for the greater New York, New Jersey market. And finally, we have uh, John Reinhardt. John uh, has too many titles to actually go through. Um, uh, he is currently the uh, qualified purchasing agent, town uh, administrator, and CFO at Wharton Barrow in Morris County. John spent five years as a municipal auditor. He has a unique understanding of the financial, operational, and regulatory side of county, municipal, joint insurance fund, and school finances. Working for the County of Morris as the assistant treasurer for over seven years and a borough of Wharton uh, since 2003 has given John the ability to experience municipal govern op uh, government operations, from both a large organizational view down to a small town. John served as chairman of the Mars County Municipal Joint Insurance Fund and also served as chairman of the Municipal Excess Liability Joint Insurance Fund at the statewide level. And that is our panel. All right, so the way we're gonna run this is uh, Matt Watkins and I are gonna bounce back and forth to moderate. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna start off with uh, Ursula Leo. Uh, who's going to talk about some return to work uh, items. She's put a presentation together, which is up on your screen now. And then what we'll do is we're going to move on then to Chris Klepper and then Robin Wolkoff to focus on different aspects. And then we'll open it up for questions. Um, if you are attending by phone and you want to ask a question, uh, you can hit star nine. That will raise your hand and we can see that. Um, otherwise, there is a button on your app that you should be able to raise your hand. Or you can type in the Q&A, which I see somebody's already started. Uh, but we're going to start with Ursula first, and we'll move on. Matt, do you have anything else? No, that, that I'm looking forward to hearing everybody's questions. And I think having reviewed Ursula's uh, presentation, I think this is very educational for all those of us that are municipal managers that are on this presentation. So welcome. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. This is definitely a challenging time. and. I'm gonna be giving a lawyerly answer a lot today where everything's changing, right? Everything's new. Things might change tomorrow if we get another executive order. So it's good to have these discussions and figure out what all of us are doing because it is a, it is a challenging time for sure. We're gonna cover three basic areas. The first one is going to be providing the safe work environment. Um, a lot of us have already returned to. Second is talking about different policies that municipalities should have in place. And then third is liability concerns or defense and protection of your municipality. I'm going to be talking generally, but each of you should be remembering you have your own handbooks, you have your own collective bargaining agreement, um, and those are going to be specific and govern many of the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, so just keep that in mind also. So first is um, the CDC has put out general guidelines that a lot of us are relying upon in drafting our policies because then we've got some support for them. So the first thing we want to communicate to our employees when they return, of course, is that it's going to be safety first. We're going to make sure you're protected. And the best way to do that is with a written plan. 
something that shows them, here's how we're gonna clean, here's how we're gonna bring employees back to work, here's what we're gonna do when there's questions and concerns. And it's best to have one person handle that. If you have an HR person, perhaps they're the best person to be the COVID-19 coordinator. If you have someone with medical background, whoever it is, one person, so someone knows if there's questions about where do I get the Lysol, if there's questions about their leave, who do they go to with COVID-19 concerns? I want to keep that in mind. Next thing we're going to talk about is CDC goals. So basically there's five different goals. Is you're going to identify COVID-19 risks in the workplace. And essentially that's keeping your employees, your residents, whoever it is safe and healthy. Second is reducing and preventing the spread of COVID-19. So we're not dealing with this, hopefully not, for years and in the fall and different peaks. Third is we have to educate our employees. The next couple of slides are going to seem ridiculous talking about washing your hands. And you know, I, I always tell my kids the, the happy birthday two times but we really do have to educate employees so everyone's on the same page so we reduce the spread of the virus. We also wanna have a healthy business operations as well as the healthy work environment. How do we make sure both of those are being done? Next is our guidelines for COVID exposure risk. So there are going to be employees who are at a higher risk, right? So there's two obvious ones. One is age. So the disease has had a greater effect of people who are older, right? That's factual. However, that doesn't mean we can discriminate or treat all people who are older differently. Same thing with people who are medically compromised or who live with someone medically compromised. Anytime we talk about medical conditions from an HR perspective, it makes us nervous, right? We can't make decisions based upon someone's disability or perceived disability, so we'll talk about that. But we have to be mindful there is, in reality, a higher risk for some individuals, but we can't discriminate against them. We, of course, want to minimize face-to-face -face contact. That's all why we all work from home for a little bit but allow for that social distancing, whether it be a change in office space, whether it be plastic dividers, what, what is it we are all doing to minimize that face-to-face uh, -face contact? And of course, the large gatherings. That means simple things like if the DPW always goes to coffee at a certain place, if you have a lunchroom, if there's a gathering place, you really have to look at, are you really allowing for that social distancing in those areas? Uh, teleworking, so this is a big one, right? Um, when we talk about requests for accommodations and people, we always say someone has to perform the essential functions of their job. We used to say they have to be present to do that. The last couple of weeks has taught us in a lot of circumstances, you know what, teleworking might work. So that's something we all need to analyze, think of that moving forward, plan for it. And for COVID-19, if someone's ill, are we going to allow them to telework and how are we going to decide that? We want to separate employees with symptoms from others, and we're going to send them home. And what you're going to hear is, can you, if someone has symptoms, send them home? And the answer is yes. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know that I would have said that, but now if someone has symptoms, you can say to them, you need to go. Um, and now, hopefully, the, the availability of testing is better. When an employee has confirmed COVID-19, other employees need to be confer uh, sorry, informed of their possible exposure. We have specifically, we'll talk about that later, but we're not gonna tell them the exact name under the Americans with Disabilities Act. We can't share the name of the individual infected, but we are gonna tell people who are in close contact. So how do we educate employees about reducing the spread of COVID-19? We're gonna follow employer policies. So what, are, what do we do in this illness? What are we doing for cleaning and disinfecting? Are we allowing people to travel for work meetings? Are we allowing them the residents? Are residents using drop-off boxes instead? What are all these policies that you guys have put into effect that we should talk about? Um, we want people to stay home when they're sick, unless they're going for medical care. We want supervisors to know not only if employees are sick, but if members of their household are sick or infected with COVID-19 because there's certain guidelines we need to follow from the CDC because of the virus. Again, washing hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Hand sanitizer now with at least 60% alcohol if soap and water aren't available. So do you have that available in your municipality? Because not everyone can get Lysol wipes and hand sanitizer. Again, avoiding touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Now it's different, right? You realize what, how often you're touching your face for a couple of weeks ago, you didn't think about it so much. So that's how we're gonna make sure we educate our employees. Also covering your mouth and nose with a tissue. So again, you feel like it's kindergarten, but you want everyone to be on the same page. You know, I often say when we're doing employment actions, blame the attorney. It's almost like if you have a sign, right? Something that says, you know, that little one we have about hand washing, there's also things, things we're gonna show people about, this is what you should be doing. This is how long you should be uh, washing your hands. So keep that all in mind. 
Um, let's see, where do we go? Oh, can you go back a little, please? So we've got, okay, yep. Immediately throwing away used tissues in the trash. <laughs> there you go. And cleaning and disinfecting objects, right? So everyone, if everyone has their own office, they don't have to have a mask on, they can be working and they're fine. But as soon as they have, uh, they leave their own office and go into a common hallway, are you requiring them to wear a mask then? If different people work on the same keyboard, are you washing it uh, with a wipe each time? What about telephones? Does each person have their own? Um, uh, for your guys who are on the road, how many people are allowed to be on the truck now? Is there one driver? Do you have staggered schedules? All of these things are things to think about for reducing the spread of the virus. Uh, because again, you want to the extent necessary, not allow for the shared use. Anyone can chime in whenever, please feel free. <laughs> um, so again, this workplace coordinator, you want one person who's gonna be responsible to be able to answer the questions. So implementing flexible sick leave and supportive practices and policies, we're gonna hit on this a lot later, but uh, future leave, what are we doing for that? And then our sick leave donation, that's gonna be something we have to consider too. Are we gonna allow that for COVID-19 and how? And preparing emergency sick leave policies because we already had a sick leave, but now we've got to worry about the new leave permitted under the law. Next, we've got um, people who, were, who test positive for COVID-19. Are you gonna require them to have a doctor's note to return to work? Problem with that is practically speaking, a lot of our physicians are in the thick of things and unavailable to send a note saying they've tested positive. And then a week later say, here's how long until they return and then to clear them. So you wanna be again, consistent and uniform. And that's really gonna be the theme of the day, consistent, uniform and document that if someone tests positive, do you, uh, the CDC says you don't have to require a note, but under the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act and under the Expanded Family Medical Leave Act, you are okay in requiring that note. So you wanna be consistent in what you're doing. Hey, Ursula, we had a question. Sure. Uh, can you require employees to wear a mask? Yes, you can uniformly across the board. Um, and you wanna make sure you're clear in implementing that. Yeah, under the CDC guidelines, it's, it's fair, again, consistently. Two exceptions, which you'll have here. If someone for their own medical reasons says they can't wear a mask, you don't require them, or if people are under two years of age. That's, that's the guidance as of now. Thank you. So again, you're making sure your policies and practices are consistent with public health recommendations. That's what we have now, might change, and then existing state and federal employment law. So the question is, so if someone refuses to wear their mask, unfortunately, we're seeing in retail, people are upset when the security guard is telling them to, to wear their mask and they're acting inappropriately. You can say, if someone doesn't want to wear their mask in the workplace, then they need to leave because that could be your requirement for your workplace. And that's fine. And um, I believe um, Robin also wanted to uh, contribute. Just on mute. Sorry, I, I was just checking it off that Ursula was answering that live. Uh, there was another question that we had in our chat about um, touching doorknobs. Uh, I think John answered that. I think anytime there's a common solid surface that you're touching, good hygiene, wash your hands. You know, going back to what Ursula said in the beginning, you know, what all the things we learned in kindergarten, that's what we should be doing now. And let, let me just jump in too, uh, for, for those of us that are bringing employees back or, uh, you know, for instance, Bloomfield starting to bring back employees on Monday. So one of the things that, that um, I, I, we're putting together is, is proper use of gloves. Um, you know, the, that, that's one of those great misunderstood issues. Um, people put on gloves and then they, uh, they, they walk around, go to the restroom, come back, uh, sit down at their desk, work with gloves, touch their face, and they've just done, they might as well not had gloves on. Um, so one of the things, and, and the same with masks, is, uh, you know, the, the issue is, what, does, what do masks do for me? What is it? One of the things that I've stressed to my employees and repeated it several times in my, in my uh, procedures, the mask is to protect uh, everyone from you um, and gloves are to protect you from everyone else so you know we require masks to be worn on any common areas of the municipality and, and in the building 
Uh, obviously, you have to wear them outside. That's part of the executive order. But when you're in the building here, we, we in the common areas, the hallways and everything, we're an old building, so we have these huge hallways. Um, you have to have a mask on. Uh, and then if you wear gloves, that's, that's your option. If you want to make yourself sick, okay, then wear a mask and rub it all over the place. Um, but the mask is what protects us from, from the individual. The gloves protect you from everybody else. I think that fundamental, that, that slogan, if you will, uh, is, is, what, is what is essential for people to understand. Because um, I, I get this already with employees that are coming in and out of the building since this, we've closed down is that, you know, well, nobody's here, I don't need to wear a mask. Well, that's, that's true, you don't, but you can, you can spread it around. So from now on, more and more people are coming in, now you have to wear that mask. Um, it's, it's an essential part and it, it will get to, and I can't remember, Ursula, if you're gonna get to this, but if you, if you set down a policy, communicate it in writing, consistently implement it, somebody violates that, it's subject to disciplinary action. And I would look to Ursula maybe to comment on that. But I know that I'm going, I, I, can, I can already guess which employees I'm going to end up suspending because they won't comply. Um, because they're, you know, like Reinhardt, they're just one of those people that are antagonists. I kid <laughs> only my friend. But it's, it's you, 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 the, the practice has to be there and of course, as with anything, those of us that are in leadership roles, it begins with you. Um, if you're walking around without a mask on, uh, and just because you're running down to the restroom, that just sends the wrong message. And it's hard to get used to this, but that's one of those key things that has to be done to stop the spread. Hey, Ursula, I'm gonna, there's a question that was just posted. It says, if you stay more than six feet apart in the office, do you still need to wear a mask? depends on your policy but I think if your policy says you need to have your mask so typically what the policies say mask on at all times unless you're in your own office with the door closed then you put your mask on no matter how far away people are right and, and that in, in my policy that's what it is if you're in your own office you do not need to wear a mask and gloves obviously I'm in my own office I'm not wearing a mask and gloves carry it out to other people you should show that common respect for people and not and wear the mask we also had another question uh, concerning civil service towns made a decision to continue to pay our employees regardless if they're working or not. Most full-time office employees are rotating between in and out of the office as well as working remotely. However, I have several part-time and some full-time community center staff as well as bus drivers who will not be scheduled to come back for some time. We still need to adhere to the standard CES guidelines of noticing these staff, i.e. 45-day layoff notice and the like. You might get into that now, John. I can answer that. Say it one more time, bud. I'm sorry, I was responding to another question at the same time you were reading. Sure. Uh, concerning civil service towns, we made a decision to continue to pay our employees regardless if they are working or not. Most full-time employees are rotating between in and out of the office as well as working remotely. However, I have several part-time and some full-time community center staff as well as bus drivers will not be scheduled to come back for some time. We still need to adhere to the standard CS guidelines of noticing these staff, i.e. 45 day layoff notice and the like. Ooh, Matt, you're civil service. Yeah, so, so first of all, civil service rules were only applicable to state employees. They were, they were uh, optional for a local government. So you, you did not necessarily need to, to do that. I strongly recommend that if you're a civil service town, you do follow those things, but it is still your option. So in Bloomfield, we followed that at the beginning, but now, you know, we're, we, we thought this would last a month. Haha. <laughs> and um, now we're, we, we have to change that policy. You still have to comply. If you're doing a layoff, you still have to comply with civil service rules of, 
developing a plan, submitting the plan, getting it approved, then give 45 days. If, if you have, you know, that's assuming that these employees are civil service, in the civil service, they're part-time or, or however you have them classified. Um, one of the key things that I would stress parenthetically to all this is there's still, you know, what's good for one town is not going to be good for another. Um, uh, and so you, you have to go by individual, you know, what your, what your policies are going to be. Not every town's bringing everybody back. Um, Bloomfield's bringing them back. Everybody will be back here uh, at the end of, end of May, and, and it remains that way. So, um, but yeah, civil service, you have to comply with the rules, but you, you do not have to pay employees that all that, which came out in one of the first executive orders, it did not apply to local government. It was very confusing when it came out, but that's what the determination was. And Mike Carino asked a question, uh, if an employer requires masks, do they have to provide the mask? Yes, uh, I think that's an individual thing, but I, 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 I would strongly, strongly recommend them. I mean, we have, I bought, uh, you know, I bought uh, 30,000 masks, they're 80 cents a piece. It's, it's really a very small amount of money. Uh, uh, but but if, if, you're, if you're requiring that, I would contend that you should provide them, as well as gloves. There's also another question. Uh, do you recommend uh, workplace signage or written policies regarding hand washing, covering your cough, et cetera? And if you do uh, require those policies, do you have uh, a, an example that you can share? You, um, John, you want me to answer all these things? <laughs> No, you, you keep going. You're doing a great job. I'm, I'm typing my responses on the screen to people. Okay. Um, the, the answer is you should, you should post. There's a lot of good um, posters and things about hand washing and that the like, like on, on the CDC website, the State Department of Health has these things up there. They're, these are all very, very good uh, signs. You should have them up on, on your website. You should have them posted. Um, for instance, we, we posted, you know, at our elevators, there's only one person allowed in, the, uh, in our elevator at a time. That's it, because you can't maintain six foot distance. Um, you know, I took my council chambers, which is a big room. I, I set up tables, but they're, they're, there's only four chairs at each, uh, uh, and, and they're all set six feet apart and tables around so that people could have group meetings um, once we're all back. These things you should have all this all this posted up on your uh, up in the hallway as well as in your policy. There's there's a lot of policies and procedures. Um, those of you that are in NJMMA, um, I'm going to talk to President McDonald about uh, posting. I have a policy and procedure. This is a short two page two page simple two page document but I think it covers everything. Um, I'll be glad to share that with anyone. But again, it's your policy, it's your procedure. And, it, and as with any policy or procedure, before you put it out there or before you implement it, make sure you provide it to the unions so that they, and they have an opportunity to comment uh, about it, they, they can't really change it. They can comment about the procedure, but share that with them. Make sure it's circulated and then make sure it's sent out to all the employees. You cannot, if you, you do not broadcast that, if you do not get that in their hands in some way to signify that they have received it, you're gonna have a hard time imp, you know, enforcing it. Matt, there's another question. It's either for you or Ursula saying uh, layoffs versus furloughs in the eyes of the Civil Commission. I yak too much, your Ursula. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if you have experience with it, Matt, but I, I don't yet know the difference between the layoffs and furloughs for COVID. Have you dealt with it at all? Yeah, so furloughs, furloughs are, are, 
it, it, it does not have as much civil service um, received. It depends on how you're handling the furloughs. Um, um, back in the, the last uh, recession in 2009, I, I furloughed literally every one of my employees one day per month, including myself, uh, which was very weird. Uh, but but you, you can you can implement those kind of things. Um, you you should communicate with civil service about it. Layoff is completely different. Layoff is when you're really uh, you 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 are completely downsizing. Um, um, you know, if if you start to go through a reorganization, you know, some of us contend that this 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 uh, economic impact of this uh, pandemic is going to go on for have long, long range effects. So some of us may be looking at our organization saying, all right, we got to shrink it down. We got to cut down our payroll. So in, in cases when it's more permanent like that, I would recommend that you look, go through the, 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 um, the rigor of doing a layoff. If you're just trying to get through uh, a short period of time, um, furloughs can be are, are, are easier to, to handle. Um, uh, but you know, it, 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 they're all very tricky, and I, I, I hesitate to give this kind of advice to people because so much depends on what your specific town and what your circumstances are, where your status is with civil service, are, have you kept up with it all? Uh, and, and, and those requirements that you have, what kind of form of government you are, all that stuff starts to come into play. You should hire a good labor attorney if you don't have one. Ursula's right there. Um, and a um, uh, good labor attorney to help you guide through it. I've been through it two times in my career. Um, and I would not do it, I still wouldn't do it alone. I would have, I would have a labor attorney helping me. There's just too many moving parts, too much complication, and all of it depends on how you have organized yourselves within civil service and how they have you recorded. Um, you know, all of you that are civil service understand that you may have people in positions that you've given them a title, but in civil service, that's not really their title. Uh, it's somewhere else. And if it's not within that particular department, you may have moved them. You know, I, I moved somebody from the police department over to the parking utility. Well, if I didn't register that with civil service, then laying them off is going to be harder. Uh, furloughs is much easier. You don't have that kind of rigor. We have another question. This might be for uh, either Christine or Ursula. If we send a, an employee home for not wearing a mask in common areas, do we count that as a sick, vacation, personal, or paid leave, or unpaid leave? It's discipline. Yeah. Yeah, it's so the issues that come up, right? They're being insubordinate by not wearing right. a mask. There's a rule in the workplace. Right. So we can start there, and then it's what you do when you send an employee home. Is it with pay? Um, so I think what you do for that first employee is going to dictate how you're going to handle all employees who some may push that envelope a little more than others. So think of it in that perspective. So I, I before this, uh, we were met yesterday and I said that I was willing to, for any employee that did not want to comply, was willing to do all exit interviews by Zoom. <laughs> So we did have one question, since all the questions are serious so far. Uh, one of the questions was, um, will we be addressing how to grow a strong COVID beer like this on this call? <laughs> <laughs> so we won't answer that one, but it, sure, we interject. We ought to grow hair. I mean, look at that. <laughs> well, it only grows in certain places. Mine grows down, not up. <laughs> all right. So we can pick up where we left off, um, but I, I agree with everything Matt said. You know, when you're doing a layoff, the detail that you need to provide in there, you've got to be planning for that well ahead of time. Um, and that's something, if you're thinking about it, you take very seriously. Um, just going back one last time, I think that employee assistance program is really important. You know, we're talking about 
the big picture and of course what you guys are dealing with, but people are really afraid to go to work right now, right? So we've got rational anxieties and we have irrational anxieties. We have political ideas that get tied in there. So if you have an employee assistance program, do, including in your policies and in your language and bringing people back to work, direct them to those policies. If you don't have any internally, there's county and state uh, options available also, because I think, again, it gets back to educating. If people understand what their risks are, understand what you're doing, it helps. So don't forget those assistant programs for the people who are struggling at this time. So social distancing, flexible work sites. Again, that teleworking, how are you handling it? Make sure you do it non-discriminatorily in a scheduled document. Uh, flexible work hours, same thing, staggered shifts, how are people working? If you assign someone to group A and they wanna be in group B just because they want that Friday off, it's okay to say tough. You're gonna to have staggered shifts with some documentation to explain the reason why and you go with that. The physical space between your employee work sites, that's gonna take a lot of working between department heads, people who are in the office. It's gonna be hard to keep that six feet between people, so you wanna make sure you're looking at that. Um, and then also with residents, you know? In the construction department, people come right up face to face, six inches away from the construction official. How are you gonna handle that now? And of course, there's a lot of guidance that's been put out by the state regarding doing it remotely, but eventually we're gonna get back to some sort of face-to-face -face contact and how are we gonna deal with that? So also there's ventilation issues. You know, we don't all have the newest municipal buildings and we wanna look at ventilation rates because that could be an area where our employees could specifically have a lot of concerns. Um, so something to look into because there is CDC guidance out on that. And again, the PPE, masks, gloves, and shields. I don't think shields are gonna be necessary necessary for a lot of municipal. I don't know anyone who's requiring it yet. Something that's out there though for CDC, again, masks um, is the common one I'm seeing. If you're requiring it, I think you need to provide it. Um, gloves, more often discretionary than not. So again, etiquette, hand hygiene, no, uh, no touch disposal, right? For trash, if everyone has the step ones or not. Handshaking, I don't know what's gonna happen handshaking in the world, if it's gonna come, come back in a couple of months or not. But as for now, it's become the new social norm not to be. And again, those posters, again, CDC, I think the DOL even has some. Look for those posters so you can put them up about hand washing and all the rules that you expect everyone to follow. So next is, we had an executive order back in uh, April 8th, uh, 122. This is the one that allowed uh, only for essential construction projects also. But why I think it's helpful to go through is I think it sets for some sort of roadmap of what we think is going to happen um, for our other industries or the non-essential industries when they open up. So there's different paragraphs of that executive order. And one of them applies to commercial, industrial, warehousing, manufacturing, and commercial offices, and also residential, large residential with 50 or more units. And what's required order must adopt policies that have cleaning protocols in areas where operations are conducted. Now, a lot of the municipalities I work with, I know um, source out their cleaning. Um, if you do that, what's your policy say? What's your contract say? If you're asking them to do more work, that's stuff we have to think about now because your contract price probably just went up if you're now requiring the common areas to be cleaned on a daily basis rather than on a weekly basis. We can move to the next one. Um, and then there's also the question about other areas. Who's cleaning them? Are you asking employees to wipe down certain areas um, and make sure you're getting them the equipment and the things that they need, whether it be Lysol wipes if you're lucky enough, right, or not? And then do you have enough workers for the cleaning jobs that you're, and it's, it's, a big, it's a big ask, right? And if you have DPW separate than sewer and water, what are you doing to make sure all those facilities are safe for the people who are uh, working there as well as your residents and visitors? So again, the executive order has specific provisions regarding manufacturing businesses, warehouses, and then our essential construction projects. And they also had to have additional policies adopted. Again, not necessarily applying to municipalities, but something that we can look at. Non-essential visitors are prohibited from entering the work site. So again, a lot of the municipalities I work with have already shut their doors. No one's allowed in as far as residents. That's gonna change eventually, but how are we gonna determine who gets in and who doesn't, which department, how do they come in, how are we gonna handle the doors, all of that information you wanna think about. Work site meetings, are you allowing department heads to have Zoom meetings with everybody? Are they face to face? How are we dealing with our different groups? Because as of now, it's still that number 10 threshold from the executive order that, that we're looking at. 
Um, and again, our six feet of social distancing is important. <clears throat> so again, staggering work schedules. I know a lot of us are already doing this. Uh, one person do a truck, Monday, Wednesdays, different nights uh, and uh, morning shifts. But again, allowing people to have different staggering helps. Same thing with people, if everyone doesn't come in at 8 a.m., that allows for a different staggering. Um, same thing, lunch breaks, work times, whatever it is, but make sure it's still best for your operations. Safety is the utmost importance, but again, you wanna also consider your operations and those common areas, the restrooms, the break room, make sure that those become a gathering place where people aren't engaging in the social distancing. Um, the executive order requires workers and visitors to wear their face masks in accordance with the CD recommendations. And again, except for uh, under two years old and if it inhibits health. So the employer expense, employers should be paying for, should be providing the face masks. If a person says, no, I'm not gonna wear the face masks and they tell you, no, it's not for medical reasons, then, I'm sorry, they say it is for medical reasons. You can't then under the executive order and under the law right now, you can't say, I don't believe you, show me, show me your doctor's note that says you can't wear a mask. So that's frustrating, right? Because there might be people who take advantage of that. But as it stands now, if someone tells you they have medical reasons, no documentation is required. However, I would argue if you have reason to know that, that that's not the case, you can try to push it. Um, maybe you want to speak to the union, maybe you want to speak to the department head, again, consistently, but understand if they do pull the medical card, um, and it's legitimate, then you have to permit the entry, which is probably gonna make a lot of your other employees very nervous, um, but that goes back to employee education, letting them know this is your policy, if this is where we have to go in your policy. Um, next, uh, infection control practices. Again, that's the hand washing, the, the tissues, disposal, silly things from kindergarten. Limiting your sharing of tools. This might be a new budget uh, increase for you. Now, if someone, has a set of tools that the whole department uses. Is it a simple way you can buy a couple more wrenches? Is it a couple of different machines, not machines hopefully, but little pieces of equipment that you have to buy to allow for a limitation of sharing? That's something you wanna consider. And again, the hand sanitizer, the wipes, do you have enough? Um, do you have enough planned in the future? Um, and again, how are you gonna sanitize those high traffic areas? So as of now, Executive Order 122 doesn't Specifically, those requirements don't apply to municipalities. I expect we're gonna get further executive orders. Two days ago, we got the declaration of emergency declared another 30 days. Um, and those executive orders, when they come out, just like everything that's changing, may have different or additional things that you as a municipality are gonna do to provide for that safe workplace. So other last thing on the safe workplace is OSHA. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert in OSHA as to all the additional requirements that exist, but make sure your department head, your DPW, your sewer water, know if there's any additional rules, if you have packages coming in from certain places so that you're also in compliance with uh, OSHA to protect your employees and your residents. And then we're up to the handbook policies, if anyone wants to chime in before then. No? All right. We'll skip forward to the next slide is for handbook policies. Oh. So for a keyword, that's just a keyword we have to know? Yep, you need to know this word for the survey that you will receive at the end of the um, the, sem the webinar for your credit. All right, so just okay. emphasize that everybody, everybody, on, this, everybody yes, on this call yeah. that needs to get CEUs needs to remember these three words are gonna come yeah. up. So the first one is consistent. Yeah. So write it down. All right, so number one, consistency. Okay, next we're gonna talk about handbooks or policies. And again, you might have collective bargaining agreements or certain civil service rules that apply to you. Um, but I think there's some important new policies that you need to look at on the next slide. We'll start talking about them. First one is survey questions. So this is one of the first things you need to think about if you're bringing employees back to the workforce. Are you gonna ask them, and you should be asking them, have they been in close contact or do they have any symptoms of COVID-19, right? So those survey questions should be written out in a policy and you have this one person who's in charge of it for your municipality that says, have you been in close contact? They know what to do. They know that if someone says yes, they're not gonna freak out and ruin confidentiality, right? So we have to make sure we have this survey question ready. And whether they've had close contact. So 
Close contact is at least 72 hours prior to the symptoms even, and close contact is somewhere between 10 to 30 minutes within that six feet. So we're gonna look at that. Household members. So it's not just the person. If they go home every night and they're exposed to someone with COVID-19, you're gonna ask about that. You're gonna monitor your employees. The EEOC, Employment, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has come out and basically all the rules that we lived by three months ago, they said in this case, because of this public health emergency, you can ask and do things that you weren't allowed to do before. So again, I was telling you before, don't ever ask medical questions. I don't wanna know, la la la, right? Not anymore, you're gonna ask these medical questions. You're gonna treat it as confidential medical information, but because it's a public health issue, you can ask and you can send people home if they have symptoms of COVID-19, particularly if they have positive test results, and we'll go through all this in a minute. But again, you're keeping the information private, what if someone says to you, I'm okay, I'm okay with you telling them it's me that tested positive or it's my wife. So that way everyone isn't freaking out saying you've been in close contact with, they know it's me. I wanna make sure you have some sort of written authorization from that person so that you can document that they said it's okay. And you probably even wanna go the step further and get a HIPAA authorization because you are sharing their confidential medical information. When you're monitoring employees, consistent questioning, right? It's literally gonna be a worksheet that's one person could be when they walk in every day, have you had any symptoms? Go through the symptoms list. Have you been in close contact with who, when, how long since symptoms? All those questions should be consistent. And again, the same person is asking those on a daily basis. What is your attendance plan? We talk about staggered work schedules. Again, the days and shifts, document that. So again, there's no discriminatory allegations later because the employee who has been problematic and having complaints, they weren't assigned to the night shift for that reason. It's because of why. Was it based on seniority? Was it based upon different skills? Be able to explain how you staggered the work shifts and why. And if people are allowed for, to work from home, again, make sure it is consistent and documented with a solid explanation. Same thing with hours of work. And if you're changing pay, you want to make sure you speak to someone before you do that. Um, but there are times when and who knows what we're gonna be dealing with from a financial perspective. So if you're changing that, that's something you can look to at this point also. Vacation policies. Um, if you don't have unions in place, you've got civil service and you've got your own handbooks to deal with. I know in the private sector, when we've got employees that we're paying for weeks at a time, we're taking away vacation moving forward because we can't afford it, right? So that's something you can consider. But again, look at your CBA, look at your own policies, civil service. Mail policies, I still don't understand. I've been reading on this, right? It depends if it's cardboard, is it plastic? Is it a day, is it um, have a Have a policy so your employees feel comfortable when a piece of mail comes in, this is what we're doing. Or when it lands on their desk, they understand it's safe at that point. Leave policies, so this I can spend a day on, right? We've all been dealing with leave policies. So basically what happened is as of April 1st, through the end of this year, December 31, we've got two new things under the uh, Coronavirus Relief Response Act. The first is an expansion of the emergency paid sick leave, and then the next is an emergency family and medical leave expansion. So, um, and the next slide will go into those in more, more detail. So what does it do? So the Families First Coronavirus Response, Response Act says employees with less than 500 employees have to provide both EPSLA, your paid sick leave, and additional FMLA leave. So we already have our own policies for sick leave. We already have our own policies for vacation and personal. Those already exist, those are in a corner. New Jersey paid sick leave, if you had to comply with that, those are here. We've added now in addition to that, additional paid sick leave and additional family medical leave. So what does that do? When we talk about FMLA, we always talk about the 12 weeks and prior to this, FMLA was job protection, not job pay. That's the big difference, right? Now it's talking about pay. And what it allows for is paid sick leave for two weeks. This is the easy way to think about it, I think. Emergency paid sick leave, if it's because of medical issues of the employee um, that they're being asked to quarantine, two weeks paid sick leave at their regular rate of pay. If that, if that person worked 40 hours a week, easy 80 hours. If that person worked 10 hours a week, you're looking at 20 hours. Whatever it is for their regular rate of pay, the look back window is essentially the previous six months, then that is what they're gonna get under paid sick leave if they're unable to work because of quarantine or the advice of a healthcare provider or they have COVID symptoms and they're seeking a medical diagnosis. 
So that 80 hours or two weeks of paid sick leave now is in addition to anything else that existed. This is something that the employers are paying and we're supposed to get these tax credits for, which I don't pretend to understand yet that well either. That's the gist of it for emergency paid sick. Now in the next slide, we're gonna to move to the FMLA. So that was sick. Now we're gonna deal with what if you have to worry about your child or you have to care for someone else. You can again get two weeks of paid sick leave, but now only at two thirds of the regular rate of pay. That other previous two weeks, if it's for your own full pay, up to a certain amount. Um, but for your somebody else's, so because of the employee is unable to work because of a need to care for someone else subject to quarantine or to care for a child, which is either under 18 or if they have a child who's older than 18 with a disability who needs care, then if that school or child care provider is closed, which it is now until who knows, right? Um, then that you're gonna get two thirds of pay for. That's the two weeks, right? Now we get an additional 10 weeks. FMLA, think of the 12 weeks. Now you're getting up to 12 weeks. So you get additional 10 weeks at again, two thirds pay um, for an employee to care for their child when it's closed. Um, the only difference for the, um, the last 10 weeks under the, the additional Family Medical Leave Act is you have to be the employee that has to be employed there for 30 calendar days. The first two weeks of pay, they can be employed for a day. This is only in effect, goes back to April 1, all the way to the end of this calendar year, December 31, 2020. Ridiculously complicated at times, especially when you're dealing with your other paid issues. A notice has to be posted in the workplace if everyone's working remotely, you should email everybody this notice um, so it's acknowledged because it's an additional leave provision. And when you're bringing employees back, this is be gonna become an issue because people are gonna have that fear, people are gonna have that anxiety, and people have kids who they need to take care of that they can't if they're not working remotely. We have a few questions. Um, are different policies, particularly in scheduling, acceptable for different departments? Uh, police department and DPW work from home options are very different than the central office staff. So I'll, I'll answer that, Teresa. Yeah, they, you're absolutely uh, um, able to set those, those schedules different um, and, and they, can, they can change as, as you deem necessary, but it's just that you have to you have to provide notice to do that. You have to make sure that the union is aware. If you have unions, uh, you have to make sure that they're aware. Just you know, before you make changes, always always tell them in advance. Don't you know come in the next day and say, okay, tomorrow you're going to start working at 5 a.m. instead of 8 a.m. Um, you you have to you have to do that. Um, but absolutely, schedules are different. Um, I, I, over the last uh, seven, eight weeks, uh, you know, police department restructured its, itself. Of course, the police department can do that uh, under the executive order. Um, they have different rules, and that was provided. They could sh change shifts, so we split a, 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 a tour of duty into four different tours. Um, so that uh, no more than four police officers were mustering at a time. Uh, that way, if one of them were contaminated, as happened, then we wouldn't quarantine the entire shift. Um, DPW uh, did a similar thing where they, they flexed the schedule. But that was all worked out with unions ahead of time. Um, I think that answers that. Another question was, can each department keep and ask questions? Is it better uh, to have one person across the board, some employees work in a different site? Consistency. <laughs> one person. It have to be one person, just make sure it's one policy. One, you know, um, you, know you, you, you can't have one department telling somebody it's okay to do this and another saying do that. Um, be consistent about that. Well, one of the things that we're doing here is, you know, we, we pick up our own garbage. Uh, we have the, the crew that's on the back of the truck drives to that neighborhood ahead of time. The truck comes in, so they're on opposite sides of the truck, so they maintain distance. You know, just, just little things to maintain it, their safety. 
can an employee opt to use their paid time instead of being paid two thirds of their salary under the FFCRA when taking off to care for school aged children? Yep, I just have them document that's their choice. And also, uh, so can a combination of those uh, programs listed be used? We were led to believe that they could use two weeks pay and then they could use family leave due to children. Is that not the case? Yep, you're just limited to that 12 weeks time period. Um, so however they want to use it and actually both allow for intermittent leave too. Um, so if there's intermittent leave and it allows for, it might expand beyond the 12 weeks at that point. Same thing, if they want to fill that in with some other accumulated PTO, they can do that. Also, uh, for staying home with a child under 18, is it one occurrence per child or one occurrence per employee? Uh, luckily, it's that 12 weeks. That's our, that's our border. So as long as it's within that 12-week time frame, unless, again, the caveat being intermittent leave, that's how it's determined. And you can make sure that there's no other available parent because sometimes I don't know when there's somebody else available, you can ask that. So it's gotta be when there's no other care available. And what about caring for an elderly parent? Is that covered? Only under the first two weeks. The second 10 weeks is all related to childcare. So, but there's one more question here that somebody thought that the laws for sick and child care did not apply to municipal government, only state employees. <laughs> no. Not as far as I know. Yeah. No. Uh, you stated that it can be used it intermittently. We're also told that was not allowed. So under the regs that came out, it allows for intermittent leave as long as the employer agrees. So you can say it doesn't work for me, but um, if you can allow it and it allows them to meet their job functions, you can go through an accommodation request if you need to. But if, it, if it's allowed by the employer, uh, it's, it's permitted. I anticipate that without the ability to travel or take advantage of other leisure activities, employees will not want to take vacation during this pandemic. This will leave a good deal of vacation time available at year end which will be difficult to schedule and will result in overtime. Can we require employees to take vacation time to avoid this issue? State law is pretty, you know, consistent, you know, about how much you can carry over uh, and allow them to carry over. Um, the only, and, and, and it's when they're into that excessive amount of carryover that you can force them to force them in the sense of saying you you be careful with that 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 uh, you can make them take vacation so let's say you have you know the the maximum amount they can carry over is two years so let's say they have you know 10 days a, a year so they have 20 days now they're into they they get to the end of the year they actually have 25 days um, you, you for, do not make the, the fundamental mistake that I know Perk ruled on um, a few years ago where they said, well, you have to use that vacation or you're gonna lose it. That's, that's a violation, that, that's not possible. What you can do is you can say, listen, you have to use those five days, for example, in the first, within the first quarter of the year or first six months of the year. And, and that forces them to use it and of course, if they get, if you said, use those five days within the first year, first quarter of the year, and they fail to do that, you can't take those vacation days away from them, but you can suspend them for insubordination. Um, I, I actually had to do that at one time where, you know, this employee just failed to use up the time and, and, uh, and um, I, I suspended her for guess what, the amount of time that she hadn't used. So, uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, but I, I think that all of us are going to be faced with that. Who wants to take a vacation to nowhere? Um, uh, I think we're all going to be faced with that, so it's a good question. But you have to be careful with it. But do you have, we have state limits. Uh, you may have limits in your CBA. You may have limits as a policy in your township. You stick to those, those limits. But I think I would be careful uh, to be forcing that down everybody's throat right now. These are unusual times and, you know, 
one thing I just want to say, generally speaking, because I have to leave in 25 minutes, um, that, that uh, you know, I, I believe that we all have to be thinking uh, 12 months at least of this. Um, you know, we don't know what will happen, but I think it'd be, it'd be, uh, it'd be wrong not to anticipate this to carry on for at least, in, in my mind, a, a year. Um, we're all going to be facing financial uh, calamities in, in the fall and into next year. Uh, I think you have to plan on that. So the things about masks, about hand sanitizers, about gloves, you know, uh, I, I ordered tens of thousands of these things just so that I had them. Because first of all, it takes forever to get them. Um, and and you, you, should, you should plan on that. Um, that's going to last a very long time. So this thing with vacation is going to be a problem for us and you know, from 20 to 21 and 21 to 22, I would contend. I would be careful with it. We also have another question. Uh, municipalities that have municipal pool utilities, do you foresee the possibility of them opening? No. Not a chance this year. No. Forget it. And one last question. Uh, our municipality was also told that once school ends, as it was deemed to end, that the employee has to return. If they are granted the 12 weeks and it will pass that time of the end of the school year by law, can we tell the employee to return to work or is that a violation of the law? I think that's gonna be a violation um, because of childcare provider. Some additional regs came out and I know the question is whether even a summer camp considered childcare. Right. And as I'm reading it now, I think it is, again, could change. But as long as someone is unable to work because they have a child that they need to care for, now that school is out, if they had a regular summer camp or something where this kid was supposed to go and now they can't, I think that is going to fit within the definition as it stands now. <laughs> with, with an asterisk, it might change again. But as it stands now, it includes anything that someone needs to care for a child, school, summer camp, whatever it may be. Okay. Uh, Laura, I think we're going to try and do a survey question or two at this point. You're, you're muted, Laura. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> we're trying to fix your, that other issue. Um, okay, so we're gonna, we're trying to figure out, we're gonna hit a polling question. Um, I'm gonna launch the polling. Okay. Can you answer that? So here's the deal. They're all at, we don't know how to do one at a time. John, I know you figured that out last time in Zoom, but, um, if you want to, uh, okay. Unfortunately, as a, as a panelist, we don't get the poll question. Um, I could have let you do that. That's all right. So, Michaela, can you can can it, can everybody see that or no? I see it. First question is: Have you developed a written um, return to work plan for dealing with employees? So, most people are saying no. Um, Will you require your employees to take a daily baseline temperature test? 70% are saying no. And have you implemented a social distancing plan yet? 74% are saying yes. And have you made any changes to the procedures for your first responders? That's about even. We got 57% saying yes and 42% and saying no. Good. Yeah. So for those of you that are in NJMMA, I, um, I will talk to uh, the president about posting uh, policies and procedures and make that possible. If you're not a member in JMMA, you should sign up. <laughs> we got we got we got Reinhardt to sign up. I mean, you know, that was impossible. Actually, I never paid my dues. I figured that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, we can pick up with um, the next slide talks about monitoring employees following up on that polling question there. Um, per CDC, 
these are the current symptoms of COVID-19. Um, towards the end there, anosmia, the, the inability to taste or smell, that was added recently. Even the, the temperature, right, that CDC is 100.4, but not everybody has a fever. So that goes back to your written policy. Do you think it makes sense to ask that question? Then you do. Um, what do the symptoms of as far as symptoms? Fatigue, runny nose, sore throat, dry cough. A lot of it sounds like allergies. So of course that's another issue, right? Um, but here are the current CDC symptoms um, that can be in your list of your policy of what you're monitoring for. Because again, you want to have some sort of consistent document uh, reason for what it is you're monitoring. Next is our CDC guidance for returning to work after an illness. The next slide here. So employees who have tested positive for COVID-19 under CDC guidelines can return to work on the following conditions. They've had no fever for 72 hours, that's three full days without medication, right? Think of those when you're returning your kid to school, right? Seven many hours, but this is three days, fever free. And symptoms have improved. So again, cough, whatever. And at least 10 days have passed since the employee's first symptoms. So 14 days is what we're looking for for quarantine, but as far as symptoms, it's looking at 10 days. But then the real, real kicker under CDC is the employees received two negative tests in a row at least 24 hours apart by a doctor following the CDC guidelines. That just seems crazy to me, right? We can't even get people with symptoms to get tests. How are we gonna have someone who's already tested positive get two negative tests? I don't know that you include that, but I want you to know what the CDC guidance is, and that is that they have the two negative tests. But I think if you do the symptoms, the fever, um, and, and the amount of uh, improvement, I think you're safe from a policy perspective, but do understand CDC guidance is all of this, which goes again to the great question of how to reopen and testing anyway. Um, but that's where it stands right now. Hey, Ursula, one uh, of the is putting up here that the department is, is formulating different guidelines at a local level. How would you react to that? As long as you're following someone's, if it's our local Department of Health, whatever it may be, somewhere document that that's what you're following, and that's fine, I think. Um, so next is you come in contact with a COVID-19 positive person. What do you do? Again, it's that 14-day quarantine that we've all been following for a while here. If symptoms develop, it's at least seven days from the onset. Again, three days without a fever and an improvement in the symptoms. Again, this is the CDC. If something else is out there, if it's state or whatever it may be, just document that that's what you're following in your, your municipality. And that's, again, contact with a, a COVID positive. And then the next is, what do you do to notify your employees if someone within the municipality, one of the employees, uh, is uh, positive? Following a positive case, you're going to notify those in close contact. And again, because of HIPAA and medical and confidentiality concerns, you're not going to be able to utilize that person's name. So what do you do? As Again, we hopefully have this one person, whether it be HR, whoever your COVID contact person is, they're going to contact the individual who's tested positive and ask, who have you worked in close proximity with? That means six feet, right? A lot of it might seem obvious, but I still think best practice is to go and speak to that individual who tested positive so you know for certainty who you should be informing. Second is it's a prolonged period of time, somewhere between 10 to 30 minutes. So you're going to err on the side of caution with 10 minutes. And then it's the 48 hours prior to the onset of symptoms. So you're collecting from the person who tested positive who you should be identifying um, as someone who's been in close contact. That way you can document that you've done your requirements. Um, no necessity at this point to notify anyone else. You can if you want to, um, as far as the Department of Health or anything. Um, it's up to the individual and their physician. But so that's if uh, how you notify your employees. Again, if someone says they want you to use their name, get a sign off and get a HIPAA compliance. So Communication, I think, is key to all of this, but particularly with people's fears on returning to work and fears of getting sick, right? So tell them what your policy is, lay out what your symptoms check are if you're doing it, lay out that you're requiring masks, offer help if people need help. If you've got that employee who you've given them the policy, they continue to ask questions, they're asking things that they've already been provided, they're saying you as a municipality aren't doing enough, consider disciplining that employee, right? Document what they're doing because that's something you don't need to deal with on top of everything else right now. And again, it can't be, can't be stressed enough. Make sure you're communicating it. So if you do discipline this employee, you can show, here's the 50 ways you showed you, we've showed you we're disinfecting between every shift. We're requiring people to wear masks. Your questions are unnecessary and you're being insubordinate. 
there's always that one person, right? You know who it is, who's gonna go, go to you with additional questions or try to keep things going. Again, document that the reason they're being disciplined isn't because they're a pain in the butt, it's because they're asking questions that they've already been answered or that are unnecessary or that are being insubordinate. Be able to document that. And you have that lead contact person who can document this is what they've been provided and it's still never enough. Act quickly, right? If someone comes to you with a valid complaint, address it. If it's some change that needs to be made, make that change and document that you did that quickly. You wanna be uniform and consistent in everything we do in dealing with employee complaints, just as if it's an HR issue, same thing with any uh, concerns about your COVID response. Communicate any changes that you make, again, document, and if someone fails to cooperate, again, whether it's the mask, whether it's questioning your policies, you know, one question's fine, but if that person rises to the level of insubordination, you can absolutely discipline those employees under our regular guidelines that exist um, today under civil service, your collective bargaining agreement, and your handbook. So our keyword number two, reopening. Again, you will need this keyword to complete the survey at the end for your, your um, credit. So while they're writing that down, uh, we had a couple of questions. Um, what about municipally run summer recreation programs? Are they going to be a reality? Well, I think, and, and I see Paula wrote that, and you see that in NJMMA's listserv. There's a lot of conversation about what towns are doing. Um, I, I think it's gonna be really hard to, uh, to, to do it uh, under what we know today. But like we've all said, it's, it's a changing environment. Um, I, I had emails back and forth this morning about the 4th of July. We're gonna end up probably pushing that, you know, 4th of July celebration. But I think it's, I think it's, I, I, I you know, the, the question you have to ask yourself is your, uh, are your people even gonna come to things, even if you open it up? Um, um, even if you have a program, or, Will it, people even come? Uh, I would contend they won't, but you know it, it's a too much of an individual situation. I do not think playgrounds are going to reopen anytime soon. Also, uh, can we make scheduling and/or work from home accommodations for individual employees based on childcare issues? This would be in lieu of them taking the twelve-week leave. That's that. I think that I would I would argue that's a that's a personnel decision that you make for your individual town. The only, the only caution is what Ursula said a couple times and said one of the key words, you have to be consistent. If you let it for one, you have to let it for another. You can't say, well, you know, uh, you do this so you can, you can do it. I, I just, I just, um, I just think that you, you, you have to be consistent with that across the board. So be very careful with it. Or I don't know that you have something you would add to that. Great, yep. Okay, I think we can move on. All right, so protecting your municipality moving forward. Um, we do our handbook sign off each year, right? We do our SEPA sign off each year. So I know in the public, um, in, the public in the private sector, a lot of times I'm recommending employee acknowledgements, right? So add this to your handbook policy and have people sign up. They understand that to come to work, I think this helps, helps alleviate fears, they're not going to be in close contact with an individual diagnosed with COVID for the past 14 days. They're gonna acknowledge that they understand that's the policy. You've got it in your policy and procedures, they can acknowledge that. Same thing, if they live with somebody undergoing testing or tested positive or have any close contact, again, it's our six feet, 10 minutes or more, then they're gonna immediately advise you as the municipality or their department head, whoever it is you have set forth in the policy, and they're gonna self quarantine, right? That's in accordance with the CDC as of now. And quarantine, as of now, is that 14 days. Again, if you're using CDC, if you are going by a different uh, guidance, whatever it is, make sure that's set forth in your policy. The, the difficulty I think of it is we've got healthcare providers and we've got general guidance, but again, make sure it's clear in your policy and then you know and everyone knows what it is you're following for your municipality. Um, the employee can also acknowledge that they understand, here's what you're gonna be doing, if it's what you're doing. On the next slide here, you're gonna screen for symptoms prior to every shift, if that's what you're doing, 
Um, so again, that can be temperatures and it's survey questions as far as whether they've been in close contact or not. And of course, the reason for this is to protect other employees um, and residents and whoever it may be who's entering the workplace. People are gonna be sent home if they have symptoms and they're not gonna allow to return to work either until they're cleared by a physician, if that's your policy, or a certain amount of days as per the CDC or whatever health authority you're relying on. So again, I think it's just a good protection to a municipality to show that employees, just like your handbook policies, just like all of the other liability, um, they're gonna abide by whatever you're calling your policy, <clears throat> excuse me, for return to work. Safety and virus spheres, and you're sharing this so employees understand what's being done. How are you disinfecting? And also, if you're doing this and you've got a, a I think uh, Matt just showed he's got a two pager, maybe you wanna stick it up there so residents understand too once you get things. Uh, it just depends on how you wanna handle it specifically. Make sure the contact person is clear within that policy. If anyone has any questions or concerns, who do they go to? And who do they go to so we're not dealing with a nursing home issue when they need more gear, right? We don't want people saying, well, they were told by their department head they only get two masks, when in reality, the manager sitting in his office has hundreds of them. So who do they go to if they need more, since this is something we can foresee as being an issue? So SEPA, our conscientious employee protection right? It says that if an employee has a reasonable belief of a violation of a law, rule, regulation, or policy, and they engage in any protected activity, which is generally going to someone and saying, I'm concerned or whistleblowing, if that person suffers an adverse employment action and there's causation between that adverse employment action, their termination, their demotion, their suspension, whatever it is, an individual can be uh, argued and have a claim for a SEPA case or a whistleblower retaliation case. So how do we protect against that? Is we wanna make sure employees, again, have a policy and understand this is what we're doing. So if they come and say, I don't think it's reasonable, this township isn't uh, sufficiently disinfecting or it's not reasonable that they require me to wear a mask, it's not reasonable if you show them your policy and show them the CDC guidance you relied on in adopting that policy then I think you shoot their SEPA case out of the water, right? Again, anyone can sue. We all know that's a disaster and you're still gonna have to deal with the defense of it. But you've got a great defense if you can show their belief wasn't reasonable when you had a policy and you had the backup for it. And our next slide also talks about, again, we're distinguishing between illegal or unethical conduct. That's what's protected by SEPA. And then there's internal disputes, right? Someone who doesn't like a certain policy. So it's gotta be a concern about a violation of a rule, regulation, or law. Um, and if it's just a concern that's addressed, that's not gonna rise to the level. But either way, we wanna make sure we're not retaliating against employees who report anything that they reasonably believe is illegal or unethical. And I do see this becoming an issue when people return to work and their concerns and their anxieties, and if there's an employee stoked in the fire, so document all employee action you are taking regarding your response to COVID and particularly any employees who raise concerns to you about your COVID reaction and uh, protocol. Real quickly, just because I feel like it's out there, the National Labor Relations Act and concerted activity and of course social media, right? So you know you're gonna have that one employee, blah, 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 really doesn't do enough. And I don't feel residents are safe. How do you deal with that, right? Look at your social media policy, understand, um, you know, there's that awful law out there that says people can say terrible thing about their supervisors and that's concerted activity protected by the National Labor Relations Act. However, given the EEOC guidance and this public health and what people are doing, uh, this is all gonna be on a case-by-case -case basis, but I want you to think about that and understand there's some concerted activity, but these are special and obviously unique times. Um, and we wanna make sure again, documenting consistency as far as what employees are doing. How do we avoid discrimination claims in this time? I think you know people's age is gonna be a hot topic as well as people's ethnicity. Um, we wanna inform all employees on the next slide here of zero tolerance discrimination, right? We already have the policies in place, but we want to make sure they're clear. Listen, if someone thinks someone is sick, who do they go to? They go to our COVID contact person, they ask the questions, and they're reminded that medical issues are confidential. If you've been in close contact, we'll advise you, right? That's not going to be enough for them sometimes. So you tell them 20 times, right? This is all I can tell you. Um, you're monitoring the workforce and you're maintaining confidentiality, but you make sure you're not making any sort of discrimination claim. So on our next slide here, again, I think disability is gonna be a concern. Um, if someone's had COVID-19, you know, we know people who've had it who have absolutely no symptoms, make sure that they're not being discriminated against for it. 
and then look at the leave requests, which again is a whole nother topic, but make sure you're fairly and consistently implementing the leave requests. Make sure you understand the pay they're entitled to because there are some great changes there. Um, so bullying, right? That's, that's one of those seminars you can spend all day. Does your handbook prohibit bullying or is it just harassment and discrimination? Look at that, particularly from the race and national origin because people have some uh, preconceived notions right now regarding that uh, related to COVID-19. Age, I don't know how many times I've said this in the last couple of weeks, right? But no good deed goes unpunished. You know you're trying to help someone by saying, listen, I understand you're older, you have a greater risk, you stay home. You can't do that. You can't treat someone differently based upon their age alone, right? You can be sensitive to it, you, but you have to uniformly and consistently apply your policies and don't change them based upon anyone's age. And then I wrote perceived down here. Under New Jersey case law, you know, we all fit into that protected box somehow. So you take disability, there's also perceived disability. There's also perceived age, right? So even if they're not disabled, if you perceive them as disabled or treat them differently because you think they are, that's gonna get you into hot water too regarding discrimination claims. So be careful, document, make sure you're being uniform and consistent across the board. Reasonable accommodation. This is gonna come up, I think. People return, and again, if they're requesting intermittent leave, if it's related to their child, if it's related to care of their mother-in-law, whatever it may be, reasonable accommodation is essentially just a request for a modification to their job, their employment practice, or their work environment. Teleworking is going to be a big issue. It makes it possible, again, for this employee to perform the essential functions. That's always the question for reasonable accommodations, is can they perform the essential functions of their job? And the litigation that we're going to get out of this and what we're looking back in a couple of years, I think is going to be very interesting because we used to always say, what's one of your essential functions? Job presence, right? I don't know. A lot of that's changed in the last couple of weeks. How many people have performed the essential functions of their job remotely now? And how do we handle that moving forward? So look at your job descriptions. Make sure if you're saying that, you can defend that now. And if it's because it wasn't as efficient, if it's because they weren't able to perform all their duties, we want to understand that when we're looking at reasonable accommodations. So on the next slide here, if someone requests a reasonable accommodation, they don't have to come to you and say, I need a reasonable accommodation, but they can say whatever it is that leads to you understanding that they want some sort of interactive process to whether they could have a change in their employment conditions to allow them to meet their essential functions. Document everything that's being done. You're never required to create a new position for that employee. But again, it could be intermittent leave. It could be a change of workspace. Um, there's a lot of different options out there. Uh, of course, uh, the employer, you as a municipality, are going to consider your undue hardship, and you're going to have labor counsel and HR involved in that. Uniform and consistency, though, because as we said, if someone wants to work remotely because of their child care, if you allow it for one, you might have just allowed it for half of your workforce. So make sure you look at that. So again, you're not discriminating. You're being clear and consistent and uh, fair across the board. And that is the end of the slide presentation and our last keyword here, COVID-19. We're about to uh, lose Matt Watkins. If anybody has a question for him before he runs, he's got three and a half minutes. <laughs> and Matt, uh, Bill Homa had a question for you. Uh, NFL released their schedule yesterday. How will fans be able to attend the football games? <laughs> <laughs> They're still going to make billions, so that's all, I, that's all they care about. Um, the, uh, um, I, I just want to thank everybody and thank, uh, Bud and Laura for inviting me and John for inviting me on. I hope this is good for you guys. I hope you all stay on. There's still a lot to go through. I apologize. I have a meeting with my mayor and I've got to jump off, but, um, uh, if, if, uh, you have any questions that are, that you want to ask me, you, you, you please use the NJMMA listserv, or you can uh, send me a note uh, at Bloomfield. So um, I hope you all wish you well, and uh, everybody, uh, good luck with your return. Thank and for you. the rest of the rest of the attendees, that, that we're not done. It's just Matt who's done. Yeah, I see some people are thanking us, but we're, we're not done yet. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And we have a couple of questions still. Um, will these policies for employees also be carried forward to any public entering the building? Specific concerns for the upcoming primary election voter who refuses to abide? Huh. 
I, I have no idea yet. Um, so in general, yes, I think you can require members of the public to to wear a mask. The only my caveat is election. I think that's going to be something we're going to have separate direct orders on how that's going to be handled. But in general, your policies apply to the workplace and anyone who goes in there having to wear masks is fair. And another question, what about an employee who is pregnant and has a doctor's note saying they should stay home? This employee has been working remotely. Would it be recommended to still have them return and have to use days? So as soon as you have that physician's note, you've got to engage in the interactive process where you find out how they can meet the jobs. And if they have a doctor's note that's requiring them to stay home and they've done that successfully for the last several weeks, I think you're going to be hard pressed to argue it's not a uh, reasonable accommodation request. And that's something you're going to have to go through with counsel and the, your HR department. Okay, and we'll continue to take questions. And if any of the panelists have any other thoughts that they'd like to share at this time too, I'd be, I think the group would be happy to hear them. So, but you wanna move on then to return to work considerations from Chris? Sure. Sure. Hi everybody. So I think one of the things that, um, you know, we heard through um, Ursula's presentation is consistency. So how do we deploy that in terms of everything else that you know, we're, we're gonna be doing? And, and I thought maybe a, a good spot to talk about would be um, how uh, employers are thinking through different solutions in returning to work and how are we gonna screen people? Because um, I think this is a, is, is a big question. So um, I'll share with you just some experiences that we've had with um, other you know private sector employers and how some of the essential uh, you know workers and hospitals and uh, warehouses and supermarkets are handling things so uh, one option is you know do you on-site temperature screen everybody who walks into the building um, and there's a couple of ways to do that either have somebody uh, a, a vendor come in and screen people every day using a digital handheld uh, no contact thermometer. And uh, then if somebody presents with a, with a fever, we, we move them over to the, the side and you know, give them direction of, you know, as, as we had discussed with, based on your policies. Um, there are other options. There's a lot of technology that has been um, developed. And you know, I think it's important to to try to you know, think through these is how often we're gonna have to be doing this, every shift, um, every employee that walks in the building, every, the public that walks in the building, you, you will have the right to you know, screen people before they enter the building. So um, are there, there's also kiosks where they could, you know, somebody could stand up right in front of the kiosk and it'll take their temperature. Um, or there's different thermal scanners. If you have volumes of people walking in, like some of the, the casinos and hotels are looking at different technology to, to screen people, um, you know, kind of a rapid uh, thermal screener. So, you know, a lot to be thought through that, that temperature taking and how do we uh, get people to answer their, you know, health questions as, as Ursula had noted. There's also some other solutions out there that um, are uh, technology solutions. Uh, a simple uh, you know, software system or computer or, or an app on your smartphone that employees might be required to log their uh, health screen questions every day and their temperature before they come into the workplace. So we kind of can pre prevent people from coming into the workplace with a fever. Um, that as, as employees do this every day, the HR team would get a report, they'd be able to go into the system to see who would be authorized to come in and who might need to stay home and, and quarantine. Um, so these are, are new applications that are being developed that are fairly low cost, um, that, that might be solutions. A lot of uh, employers are looking at at doing this and you know as a as a way to to really get people to do something before they come to the workplace and answer those screening questions and then you can have it all documented on um, uh, on a system 
it also takes, a, you know, puts that on a third party where HR doesn't have access to all of that uh, medical screening information. Uh, another thing that's, that's being talked about very frequently now is all this testing, right? Our, um, uh, the, the virus testing, you know, as employers are looking at bringing their people back to work, should they be doing um, virus testing um, or antibody testing? So let me give you some thoughts about that. So um, the, there's two types of tests, as we probably all have learned a, a lot about this virus. Um, the, the virus, active virus test is a nasal swab or a saliva sample. Um, and that would tell if somebody is, has the virus currently. Now, the issue with that is that we wouldn't get results for let's say 48 hours, okay? So that's a challenge because somebody could not have the virus today and tomorrow they could acquire it. They could go into a Wawa and, you know, touch some something and it's on their hands and they, they get the virus. So, uh, you know, that is a, is a challenge and not necessarily, a, you know, a surefire way to, to prevent the virus from coming into the workplace. And another thing that's being talked about is, is this antibody testing. So there are a couple of different ways to do antibody testing. These tests are just becoming launched in the, in the marketplace, um, the FDA has gone through some emergency approval of, of some of these tests. Um, and what an antibody test is, it can be done two ways. One is with a finger prick, and the other is with a blood draw. Um, the finger prick tests are generally give results within 15 minutes or so, and um, would let a person know whether they had the virus previously, not whether they currently have it necessarily. Okay, so it, it means that they have antibodies built up in their system because they had the virus pre previously. So why would somebody want to do a test like this? Well, it might be able to tell us whether somebody is immune to the disease uh, or, you know, so that they may not, you know, get it themselves. Are they a safe employee in essence? The challenge with that is that the researchers have not identified whether, um, how long the immunity will last. So um, they, they don't know if, you know, let's say you got the virus in March, would you be safe in the fall or whatever? We just don't know the, the time frame which, with which somebody is immune. And we also don't know whether they can get reinfected. So, the studies have shown right now that we, we don't believe right now that they can get reinfected right away, but we don't know. So um, the costs of these tests are, are generally fairly high right now, probably, you know, within the, uh, you know, 100 to $200 range for the active virus and the, and the um, antibody testing. Those are covered under the health plans. So there's, there's reasons why people would do it. But it may not be a, you know, it's it's not a guarantee that you're going to have a safe workforce come into the workplace. Um, so just wanted to share with with everybody these different types of of scenarios that are being considered amongst employers nationwide of of how do we try to protect the safety of the population um, when they return to work, and then also on an ongoing basis on a you know daily basis is something that we we're going to have to you know track and keep keep uh ensure that the sick people do not come into the workplace so Thanks. i'll leave it at that so mm -hmm. we have a couple of questions up here one is okay. uh if you have an employee that has a child care issue and their spouse can also provide child care as well can you have a discussion on why the spouse can't provide that child care um, then there's a second part to that. Can you also ask the employee to work second shift and a spouse can provide childcare in the evening? Like that might be more for you, Ursula. Yeah, my understanding is they need to show that they don't have childcare. So if they do have childcare, um, and it's almost like an interactive discussion, I, you know, I tread carefully because of these uncertain times, but I think if they have other options, that that's something you should document and have a discussion on. I think that's okay. fair. 
Um, the next question we received was based upon different departmental responsibilities, can we allow work from home and or scheduling accommodations because of childcare issues for central office staff, but not for the PD or public works? Yeah, and I, I would go so far as to say, I bet a lot of municipalities are already doing that, right? There's different needs from different departments. And as long as you can justify and document that, I think that's okay um, on a department-wide basis, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the last question we have here is, <coughs> um, I have an employee who provided a doctor's note that said that he is at high risk, but doesn't excuse the employee from work. It only states that he is more at risk. So the attorney advised this person not to press questions on another note, but would be specific to being out due to how long. Um, says I would, I would believe I would need to state the employee needs to be due to the risk of COVID and on how do you feel about that? Anybody? So luckily you, you were it? going in and out and we couldn't hear you. <laughs> oh. But I, I think what you were asking was a, was a really case specific question about an individual who had a general note that their risk, they are, they're high risk, right? Um, that alone isn't enough for them to perhaps be allowed to go into the workforce or not. So I think you do have to get labor counsel involved and you need to engage in the interactive discussion. It's gonna be case specific. Okay, great. I think we're gonna move on to Robin so we don't run out of time. Um, Robin is gonna focus okay. more on the workers comp side, but Robin, you're up. Great. Um, I will be brief, I think, because we did want to leave time for questions, but um, the word that we've heard throughout the presentations, and it was the word I had also is consistency. Um, there have been questions on how to handle workers that, you know, potentially have been either exposed to COVID-19 or say they got it at work, um, you know, and we want to make sure that every, every claim, every employee is being handled consistently. Um, part of our discussion as we discuss this um, in getting ready for this webinar is, you know, a lot of administrators are used to figuring out the answer. What's the answer on the claim? And our recommendation is report all of the claims. It's not to the town or the administrator to figure out if the claim is workers' comp or work-related or not. Leave that, let's leave that to the adjusters. Um, as you know, I'm here on behalf of PERMA. We administer the MEL. Um, we have worked very closely and continue to work very closely with our um, third-party administrators, with the adjusters, going over guidelines and helping um, look at specific claims. And each and every claim, we, we've had many discussions over this, Every claim is being administered um, and investigated on an individual basis. So we also recognize, I've heard from some towns the concern that, well, if I tell the employee to report a claim, is it suddenly, you know, are they gonna think it's compensable and are we gonna just make it seem like a free for all and everybody should be reporting claims? And, you know, we wanna be very clear, every claim is being evaluated on an individual basis. So it's not that you're suddenly going to be opening yourselves up and just paying for people that are, you know, maybe afraid of COVID-19 and that you know they're taking time out of work. Uh, another really important point that we've looked at, uh, as some people are aware, in July of 2019, uh, the New Jersey State Legislature passed the uh, Thomas P. Canzanella First Responders Act. So that provided specific protections, uh, particularly to our first responders, which would be our police officers, our firefighters, our EMTs. Uh, what that act did is essentially there's a presumption. If they have a COVID-19 claim, there is a presumption that if uh, for example, a police officer comes down with COVID-19, under the act, there's presumption that it is a work-related injury. That presumption is rebuttable. Uh, and so if there's evidence, a preponderance of the evidence that it wasn't contracted at work, then it wouldn't necessarily be a work-related claim. But these are intricacies that we expect our adjusters to be investigating, our um, workers' comp defense counsel, our fund attorneys. So really our encouragement is report the claims. Um, if an employee comes to you, and says, you know, I think it's work-related, report the claim, let the adjusters figure it out. Uh, one final comment, uh, the MEL itself uh, has a MEL website, njmel.org. We have a COVID-19 resource center on there. Uh, a lot of information has been posted there, both by the MEL and J. Montgomery um, Risk Control has been posting, has been providing regular information. So there's a great resource there, as well as on the Connor Strong website, which I know Christine has been active with um, and the MEL website also links to the um, CDC website for guidelines. So 
So, you know, be consistent, report the claim, allow the investigation to happen. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us, reach out to your adjusting team. Um, you know, as long as every employee is getting treated equally, we shouldn't have any issues. I think, John, are you, I didn't hear you. Yep, good, I muted myself for once. Um, <laughs> thank you, Rob. <laughs> Do we, do we have any questions from the attendees? Uh, give it a second, just in case people are trying to figure it out. Hey, John, for my for myself, our firm, you know, we were uh, are considered uh, an essential service, uh, but we closed our offices in mid March and have kept them closed. Uh, we're just now uh, planning on reopening the office. Uh, but we're, again, waiting to see what happens with uh, the governor, what he tells us um, should be happening, if they're going to be setting some milestones for um, people to, uh, to accomplish, to be able to go back to their offices. And we're just trying to be really careful, and quite frankly, it's a, it's a hard thing to get our arms around. Agreed. I think for everybody, everybody's a little nervous. Um, but I can't see the one question that you have. There's a Q and A. While you're doing that, we're going to put the survey link in the chat box. So if um, anyone needs to get their CPE credit or their their other CUE credit, just copy the link when Michaela puts it in there. See, um, you can see it in there now. Put it into a browser and then just take the survey. Make sure you include those three code words, and then we'll send you the certificate. Okay, go ahead. And John, one thing that we've uh, been trying to do is to uh, be constantly be communicating with our employees, surveying them, uh, trying to get their feedback, um, taking their temperature, kind of, as far as where they're at, what their thoughts are, what their fears are, um, what other personal concerns they have that everyone has a some kind of concern, whether it's their own physical self, their, their spouse, family member. There's so many different things that we're just trying to talk to them about so we can understand and make things better for them when we do eventually reopen. Agreed. I think that communication is key. Uh, it looks like there might be one more question up there, bud. Uh, so they're asking, uh, what are the credits for the CMFO? Um, I don't remember what we applied for. I think they were general, uh, two credits for general, if I remember right, John. The office management, I think, but let me just double check. I think you sent that email last night. I think we did it for uh, CMFOs, uh, county officers, and maybe uh, clerks, too. Is that correct? I'm looking right now. Um, I'm not finding it, but I know it's there. I have two for office. Here we go, quick. Did you see that? Two for office management for both, right? Yes. You got that? So it's just uh, it's financial, financial officer. Finance officer and county finance officer. And then also municipal clerks get two in professional development and QPAs get two for office admin and general duties. Okay. And someone was asking what the third keyword was. Can, can I say it? it? Okay. Do you have to show it or can we just say it? You could say it. It's COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> and some people are asking if we can email the survey link also. We'll do the, the survey link as well. Um, if you can just do it pretty timely. We ask you to fill it out within a day or two. Presentation and we'll send a link to the webinar because it was recorded. New chat. Um, so we are gonna email out the slides? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, that answers that question. All right, I don't see more questions, so I'd, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, you know, Ursula, 
Robin and Christine for participating. I think it was a lot of good information. I think people benefited from it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah. Right. Thanks for Great. having us. Thank Thanks you. Everybody. Have Be a well, everyone. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.